use the, uh, the wipes that are available to wipe the microphones. It would be much appreciated if you would do that, please. And I will show the example, though this one's on. Am I allowed to do it while it's on? You heard the Deputy Chairman of Ways and Means uh, explain to you, of course, we've only just resumed sittings in Westminster Hall. It will uh, take a little while to get used to these procedures, but I'm sure we'll all get the hang if people do observe the social distancing. And if you think about it, when you leave, if you could just wipe the microphones down, it'll save the doorkeepers some work. The question is that this House has considered... Uh, Mike Hill to move the motion. Thank you, uh, Sir David, and it's an honour to speak under your chairmanship, and it's a privilege also to open up this important debate on this, the day that Westminster Hall uh, has, uh, debates have been resumed. Uh, Sir David, I beg to move that e-petitions numbers 241848, 250178, and 300412 on the subject of Brexit have been considered. The first petition calls for a halt to Brexit while a public inquiry is held. The petition, which has over 110,000 signatures, states the UK's departure from the EU looms, but questions remain about the legitimacy of the referendum. The Electoral Com uh, Commission said illegal overspending occurred during the referendum. Were the votes of any subsequent political acts affected? Article 50 was triggered. Was the overspend known about then? A transparent public inquiry is required now, says the petition. The second petition, number 250178, has over 109,000 signatures and also seeks to establish a public inquiry into the conduct of the 2016 EU referendum. It also addresses the subjects of alleged interference by foreign actors and governments saying, quote, that this must be investigated under the Inquiries Act of 2005. The third petition, number 300412, has over 107,000 signatures and states that, quote, the government should consider delaying negotiations so they can concentrate on the coronavirus situation and reduce travel of both EU and UK negotiators. This would necessitate extending the transition period as there can only be a one-off extension and this should be for two years. Sir so David, these petitions mean very different things to different people. Some see a halt to the transition period as necessary for the safety of the public while others see it as a further attempt to delay Brexit by those who oppose it. So, David, from my own personal experience, the vast majority of my constituents would fall into the latter category, with almost three-quarters of them voting to leave in the 2016 referendum. They would not want a further delay after four and a half years of delays and false starts, unless it was completely unavoidable. As far as the majority of my constituents are concerned, the United Kingdom's 47-year-old membership of the European Union ended on the 31st of January this year. But, of course, it's not as simple as that. We are currently in the transition period, which ends on the 31st of December this year. And, contrary to points made about oven-ready deals, ready to go in the 2019 general election, Things are far from oven ready and simple, particularly on the trade deal front. And as we have seen over the last two weeks with the UK Internal Market Bill, 
which has already prompted legal action from the EU, the prospects of a no-deal Brexit are very real. The Government's final opportunity to request an extension to the transition period provided for under the withdrawal agreement came and went on the 30th of June of this year. Many would argue that 11 months was already a tight time timeline for a complex deal to be negotiated, ratified and implemented, and that didn't account for the COVID-19 crisis, which has soaked up much of the UK and EU government's energies. This has led to a number of calls for the transition period to be extended, including the petitioners in petition number 300412. The petition calls for a pandemic delay, which is perhaps the most compelling reason at the moment. The government have much to reassure the public about before, uh, about before leaving the EU in the middle of a current COVID-19 pandemic, and this petition argues that it is simply common sense in light of COVID-19 to seek an extension so that important matters can be given the proper attention they deserve, like healthcare workers, their status and rights, like medicine imports, like imports of new testing kits and PPE, like the import and export of goods and food and travel arrangements across borders. Many members will, I am sure, raise these points in the debate, and I look forward to the Minister's, the minister's response to this myself. It is common knowledge that the negotiations were delayed earlier in the year by the pandemic, and I will welcome a more in-depth response from the government as to how they believe this has affected the UK's readiness for Brexit. So, David, there are important lessons to be learned from campaigns in the run-up to and during the 2016 referendum. Petition number 250178 on foreign in interference points to the very serious questions raised by the Russia report commissioned by the House of Commons Intelligence and Security Committee. This includes the potential influence on some senior figures within the Leave campaign. So, David, I would personally welcome a further independent inquiry into this, as the petition calls for, as the government to the report of the committee has so far at best been lacklustre. I'm sure that all honourable and right honourable members will, I'm sure, agree with me that faith in public institutions in Britain is at rock bottom at the moment. It is therefore of the utmost importance as a matter of public service that we ensure some mistakes can never be made again. So, if there were foreign interference, it is vital that we establish to what extent and what measures can be put in place to avoid such an event ever occurring again. We could make a start by banning the hiring, of the, uh, the hiring out of the Prime Minister for a game of tennis, for example. However, the timing of an inquiry into this needs not necessarily derail the Brexit process. I cannot vouch for other constituencies, and I have no doubt that members will be keen to enlighten me, but I wonder how many people in my constituency were, were, a, were a year prior to the referendum, the UKIP candidate beat the Tory candidate to second place in the general election, that were actually convinced by foreign propaganda in the referendum campaign to vote leave. Frankly, it wouldn't have changed nothing in my constituency. Vote leave, of course, the official pro-Brexit campaign group, were judged by the High Court to have broken campaign spending limits during the referendum, and therefore to have broken the law. This followed on from an early decision by the Electoral Commission uh, and is central to petition number 241848 in its call for an inquiry into campaign spend. Campaign spending has a great impact on elections and voting, something that all MPs will fully understand. If overspending occurred, as was the case with vote leave, or, or, is suspected, or, or it is suspected, the Electoral Commission should investigate it as a matter of course. This follows an initial decision by the Electoral Commission to investigate vote leave, but not Darren Grimes of be leave a campaign organisation in receipt of substantial donations from vote leave as part of a joint plan according to the High Court. We must establish the facts and ensure that all political bodies in the United Kingdom act with the integrity that the law demands. With vote leave, 
already having paid a fine of £61,000, it would be of public interest to know how this affected the result of the campaign in some areas. However, again, using this as a pretext to halt the Brexit process would be seen by many as a tactic to deliberately delay. There is little certainty in much government policy, but one thing appears to be unshakable, and that's the Prime Minister in sticking to Brexit, come what may. So, Sir David, in conclusion, all three petitions have merits that warrant discussion, and all three highlight important issues which do require great, greater transparency and clarity. Government must make much more of an effort to restore faith in themselves, both from the public and in Parliament. Delaying Brexit again is likely to further widen the divisions in our society and our communities, but to do so without a cast iron guarantee on, import, on imports during the pandemic and without knowing beyond doubt the legality of the actors in the winning campaign, especially in the teeth of the current pandemic, that may also harm society. Sir David, I welcome all members to consider these points carefully and I beg to move. The question is that this House has considered e-petitions 241848, 250178 and 300412 relating to the UK's departure from the EU. I'd like to start the wind-ups at 7 o'clock. There are six people who want to speak, so I do hope that colleagues will share the time out between each other. Mr Jack Brereton. Thank you, Sir David. And I must say it is an absolute delight to be able to be back here speaking in Westminster Hall after what has been quite a long uh, adjournment to, to this chamber. Um, I also thank the Honourable Gentleman for Hartlepool for leading this debate. I do, however, find it uh, rather ironic that it is the Honourable Gen Gentleman leading this debate, given his past challenges in explaining the Labour Party's policy on Brexit. Um, the 2016 referendum was, of course, the largest expression of democracy in our British history, the largest mandate of any uh, parliament in terms of the 17.4 million people who voted to leave. These petitions are less than 1% of that figure. A government with a very large majority has been elected on a mandate to get Brexit done. We have now left the EU, thankfully, and at the end of the transition period in January, Brexit will be fully completed. Yet still now, once again, we see those members opposite trying to hamper Brexit as they have done. Debate after debate, call for delay after delay after delay. Delays I have never voted for and the British people don't accept. I don't think anyone would ever have imagined taking nearly five years to complete this process. Quite long enough, according to my constituents. I think the public have been very clear about the feelings of a parliament that did not fulfil its democratic wishes of the British people. We have seen enough delay and uncertainty the last parliament brought about to our economy and to our country. This transi transition must not be extended, for doing so can never bring about conclusion, nor can it bring any certainty. And I do think that we've had enough of that, and I think the British people, and certainly my constituents in Socontrent South, would not accept a further extension. And we should certainly not trust the views that say this is because of COVID. I think we all know the real reasons why people want the transition to be extended further. Labour and other parties opposite continue to repeat the mistakes of the past, even now questioning what people thought they were voting for and the legitimacy of the process in its entirety. How much more of their views have changed since the promise to honour the result, whatever the outcome might be. It goes to the heart of our British democracy that we honour and trust the decisions of the British people who put us here and elected us here to represent them. I know my constituents in Stoke-on-Trent South do not feel they have benefited from being in the EU and from their EU membership. They feel somewhat left behind and that whilst other areas have been seen to move ahead and move forwards, people like uh, those in Stoke-on-Trent have seen that they have been left behind. What was the only year that the UK was a net gainer from our contribution to the EU budget? Surprise, surprise, of course, it was 1975 
the year of the common market referendum. Slightly more than, our, than a coincidence, I think. I know my constituents in Stoke-on-Trent South knew exactly what they were voting for when they overwhelmingly backed leave. It's an end to being controlled by the EU, an end to sending vast amounts of money each year to the EU that we don't see back in return, an end to free movement and proper control of our borders. This is exactly what this government is now delivering. And the government's focus on levelling up will ensure all communities in every part of our country can prosper and succeed. I've been clear and I hope we secure that ambitious free trade deal with the EU at the end of the year. But whatever the outcome may be, whether a deal or no deal, it must happen to provide a clear end state and certainty, allowing our country to move forwards once and for all. Unlike many opposite, I have very much the confidence in our country, in our economy, in our government to get through this and flourish into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sir David, and it's delightful to see you in the chair and to be back in uh, Westminster Hall uh, again. <clears throat> I agree with the, most of the comments that uh, the Honourable Gentleman uh, opposite said. And first of all, I'd like to declare uh, three unremunerated interests. Uh, I am a board member for the Centre for Brexit Policy. Uh, I'm on the advisory board for the Foundation for Independence uh, and I was, until just after the referendum, a board member of Vote Leave. Uh, for those people uh, outside this hall and, in, in, and honourable members in this hall, I'd ask them a simple question because we have seen a two-pronged uh, attack on democracy since the uh, decision as the Honourable Gentleman says, the largest single vote in our, in our history in 2016. Most uh, people in this country would be horrified if President Trump uh, challenged a victory by the Democrats in the United States. Absolutely horrified if that went to the courts. But that is exactly what has happened in this country. And many of my honourable friends who care passionately about this and wanted to stay in the EU do simply do not see it in those terms. But we've had that two-pronged attack on democracy. Some from honourable members in my party and all other parties who wanted to overturn uh, the decision and from the EU itself, which is less surprising because they're a non-democratic body and they have used many tactics uh, to try and make it painful uh, for this country to leave the EU uh, as a warning to other countries who might want to uh, leave the EU. So I would start with uh, that point. I would also say that we've left the EU, as the Honourable Gentleman says, but we're still in the transition period and subject to the withdrawal agreement. I hope we get a Canada Plus style free trade agreement, which was on offer at the beginning of this process. And it is another element of bad faith from the EU that that has been taken off the table, as it's been taken off the table uh, to give this country uh, third country status. That's real uh, uh, bad faith. So I hope we can get that. But it is vital, it is vital that when we leave, we are the, the final leaving agreement is sovereign compliant. We need to have control over our fishing. We need to have control about how we subsidise um, our industry, if that's what we choose to do. This country subsidises industry, so-called state aid, at about half the rate of the rest of the EU. So it's not a big problem, but it's vital that we have control of our own laws. That's why people voted to leave the EU. So we have to have it sovereign compliant and we mustn't have overhang liabilities that are unaccounted for for some future decisions uh, that the EU may take to give us uh, more financial commitments uh, to the EU. And finally, uh, in terms of the conditions for leaving, we mustn't uh, be subject to the European Court of Justice. Otherwise, we'll not be a truly independent country. I didn't, I've supported 
uh, the decision to leave the EU in many votes in, in the House of Commons. I didn't support the final withdrawal agreement because I never believed that there, there should be the possibility of Great Britain being separated from Northern Ireland. And the EU have uh, exploited uh, that situation uh, and have weaponized the situation in the history in, in, in Ireland to try and keep control over our laws. So I hope the government uh, can get an agreement that doesn't lead to the splitting up of the United Kingdom in those terms. In moving uh, the three petitions, my honourable friend uh, referred to the legal action taken. It is the most curious legal action to David, I'm not a lawyer, but who has ever taken legal action against a bill that has yet to become law passing through this house? It's extraordinary. It's not only extraordinary in that sense, it's extraordinary and it, it goes against the EU policy itself. Uh, Caddy 1 decision, Caddy 2, which was a complicated case adjudicated on by the European Court of Justice, they came to the conclusions the obligations imposed by international treaties cannot have the effect of pre prejudicing the constitutional principles of treaties. So it's not only absurd in its first terms, it, it goes against the way they deal with, themselves, uh, with their own uh, policy. I think it was mentioned that uh, there, was, there have been a number of uh, court cases that have uh, found uh, <coughs> actions taken by parties on both sides to have been breach of the law. Uh, that's wrong shouldn't happen. There is no general election or local election I've been ever involved in where there hasn't been problems. That's just what happens in the, uh, in the heat of the uh, campaign. In terms of vote leave, uh, the Electoral Commission gave vote leave bad advice, which it took and has ended up in, in breach, which is paid the fine for. I don't believe any of that affected the outcome. The single biggest factor in, in cash terms was the government paid nine million pounds effectively to put out a, a remain leaflet which dwarfed all the rest of the ex expenditure. I'll finish by sort of swiftly uh, dealing with the petitions. Uh, the petition which uh, it cites COVID as a reason for delaying it, uh, the implementation. I, th I understand the motivation or one motivation behind that, uh, at least. The fact is, if we can control our own laws and regulations, we are in a better position to respond to any crisis that there is uh, immediately and not to be bound by uh, the European Union's bureaucracy. I'll give an example of that. It took about 18 years uh, for the EU to change the clinical trials directive and a lot of jobs went out of Europe uh, because they were so slow. We, we both in terms of building our economy after COVID and dealing with it now need to be completely in charge of our rules and regulation. I'm happy to go back to you. Um, I agree that the challenges that we've seen in the EU of getting a COVID recovery package together is just an example of that. I, I do agree uh, with that, that we need to be sprightly on our feet to deal with all. I'm not going to get into a debate about COVID, uh, Sir David, but we need to be sprightly that we have been in response to this, uh, this, this, this crisis. And being in charge of ourselves is the best way to do it. Previously said, both sides have been found to in breach of the regulations. I don't believe fundamentally... I, the mover of the motion said these things did foreign interference, did the biggest foreign in interference in terms of publicity make any difference when President Obama came over and asked people to vote remain? I suspect in many cases that boosted the leave side uh, of the debate. This country has decided to leave. 
we have to get the best deal possible. We have to make sure we get it uh, to be sovereign uh, compliant and not let the EU carry on with what are effectively imperialistic policies. They want to carry on controlling our uh, laws and regulations. They want to keep us paying without us having any say whatsoever uh, in the creation of those laws and regulations. <coughs> First ever Westminster Hall debate is on the subject I believe that got us here in the first place. As the first ever Conservative MP to represent Don Valley, who represents an area which voted 69% to leave the European Union, I felt compelled to speak in this debate. Compelled firstly because two of the petitions that we are debating here today, while being over a year old now, demanded that there was a public inquiry over the 2016 referendum. Yet for me, and the vast majority of my constituents, the motive behind these petition petitions were not entirely sincere. Instead, I believe that these petitions were established and signed because people, which petition data shows resided mainly in the southern metropolitan areas of the country, could not accept the referendum result. We really do need to move on. Since 2016, since the 2016 referendum, some members of the political elite treated 17.4 million people in complete contempt. Large sections of the media and political class actively tried to rob these people of their voice. Some, petition, some politicians and journalists repeatedly stated how the desire of the majority to leave the EU was impossible. By the beginning of the last election, some said how the referendum itself shouldn't have taken place in the first place, and one major party even promised to cancel Brexit altogether. Meanwhile, petitions like the ones we are debating here today were used to stop and grind Brexit to a halt. It was through inquiries that those who remained upset at the referendum result sought to overturn the largest democratic exercise in this country's recent history. This was despite the fact that after the referendum, Parliament itself only overwhelmingly voted to proceed with Brexit negotiations and 80% of the votes cast in 2017 were for parties which supported our departure from the EU. Hindsight can be a wonderful thing and I believe the last election which saw myself and many of my honourable members elected across the country is confirmation that petitions like these did not have the popular support of the people. The 2019 election decisively confirmed, decisively confirmed at the last election by the public that they did not want to store Brexit. Indeed, the public did not want to host endless inquiries looking at allegations that had no substance. They wanted to get on with Brexit and deliver the referendum result. Yet now we are seeing renewed calls to halt Brexit, this time due to coronavirus. Yet again, this because a small minority continues to cling to the hope that they can prevent the will of the people. I, for one, find it awful that my constituents' views yet again appear to be discarded. Yet I want to make clear to the good people of Don Valley and to the people across the north that their voices will be heard and this government will get on with Brexit. The government has already confirmed that it is fully prepared to leave the EU with an Australian-style deal at the end of this year. And with coronavirus likely to be with us for many more months and even years to come, why wait? After all, we gave the public the choices in a referendum and two general elections. I think they have made themselves quite clear. So let's get on with what I and many others were elected to do less than a year ago. Let's get Brexit done. Thank you. I have many reasons to be proud of my constituency of Bath. One of the most important things to me is its long tradition as an open-minded, welcoming and outward-looking city. Bathonians wants this country to, to, to reflect these values which we hold very close to our hearts. Bath was one of the constituencies with the most signatures for the petition to hold Brexit for a public inquiry. In 2016, 68% of Bath residents voted to remain, putting us in the top 50 remain voting constituencies in the UK. Just days after the referendum, a handful of us residents founded what became one of the most 
active grassroots campaigning organizations in the country, both for Europe. We came together as a non-party political group of volunteers campaigning for the UK to remain at the heart of the European Union. I was a founder member of Bath for Europe before I was elected MP for Bath. We were ordinary people achieving extraordinary things. We donated our spare time, talent, creativity, knowledge, experience, ideas and resources to keep the cause of Europe front and centre, both locally and nationally. In addition to organising rallies, marches, speakers, events and regular meetings, perhaps our biggest achievement was our constant engagement with members of our community. Every week we held street stores and commuter calls, handing out leaflets and discussing Brexit and what it would mean for our city and our country. We did our research and we respectfully listened to people, some of whom had opinions very different from our own. We spoke to them in a positive spirit. We became a fixture and bath, and our constructive dialogue helped lift the public discourse. One of the most damaging legacies of Brexit has been the deepening division in our society and an aggressive culture war that seeks to pit people against each other. Bath for Europe stands for equality and fairness. For example, this spring the group held a virtual EU citizens' fair to support those applying for settled status. Bath for Europe remains a force in our city. The people of Bath will continue to uphold the values of openness and inclusion and of international cooperation. And I will use my voice to represent their views in Parliament. So, David, I think it is important to stress that we shouldn't fight lost battles. Non-EU membership is now a reality. That doesn't mean that there are many millions of people in the UK who believe that our place is at the heart of the European Union and their voices too need to be heard, and I'm one of them. If you are a passionate supporter of a football club, you don't switch sides to the club who won the premiership immediately they have won. No, you stay loyal to your side. And you go through years even of relegation and you prepare for better times. E of course. I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady. Does she not think it's a fundamental of democracy that the losing side accepts the, uh, the overall result and the winners? That's how democracy works. One doesn't have to change one's view, but one has to re uh, recognise the result. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that intervention. And I, I absolutely understand that, that democracy needs to, to play itself out, and I do not want to reheat um, the battles that we had for two and a half years in this parliament. But we have made uh, the, the argument again and again that the decision that was made in 2016 was an, a very unclear decision that you needed to make clear and needed to discuss to the end and have that dis discourse whether really what, um, what people understood they voted for in 2016 is really what they wanted. The result is now there. I accept that. We had a, had a very clear election result and we are now no longer members of the European Union and that is why I say it is no, no use to now fight lo lost battles. But that we have a passion to be at the heart of the European Union and that, in fact, m almost half of the people of, of the UK still uh, believe that um, going into the um, election in 2019 and that they haven't suddenly gone away. I think the other side, the winning side, has to accept that too. And therefore, the debates that we continue to have here are not undemocratic. They are part of democracy that people have their voices heard. EU membership at some point in the future continues to be a liberal democrat ambition. I firmly believe our time will come, but in the meantime, I will stand up for all EU citizens here in the UK and for UK citizens in, the, in Europe to make sure that they can live with all their rights undiminished. That is what um, I, I, I now fight for, but to keep the flame alive that our place as, Europe, as the United Kingdom is at the heart of the European Union, I will not give up on that belief, and I do believe our time will come. Thank you. Mr. John. Thank you, Sir David. And um, it, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. In fact, it's such a pleasure that this is the second debate in a row that I've stayed for. <laughs> uh, I was down, for, down to speak in the first debate, and... When, when the, the speaker's train bearer said, but well, do you want to speak in the second one? I thought, yes, I might as well. You know, get, get my Westminster Hall score back, back up. I, I was somebody in the original referendum, gosh, so many years ago, who voted Remain. But when I looked at, uh, at, these, um, at these petitions, the, the, the one to halt Brexit for public inquiry, to extend the transition, and to look at, look at foreign... Um, to look, look, look at foreign interference. 
my first reaction was utter exasperation. And to see that COVID was mentioned uh, as the excuse for doing these just defied belief. There is an organization in Europe that is far more liberal in the, in the best sense of the, of the word, far more open to, 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 to ideas coming, coming in, and that is the Council of Europe. And it's also almost twice the size of the EU. And yet, do you think that COVID has stopped it in its work? Do you think that COVID has, has meant that nobody does any monitoring of the, of the appalling human rights situations that exist in certain countries? Uh, I'm the rapporteur for Turkey uh, in, the, in the Council of Europe, and we are holding, it is difficult, but we are holding uh, um, uh, inquiries on Zoom with NGOs in Turkey to make sure that we understand uh, what the Turkish government is, is up to and to say no to it. So you know, the, the idea that COVID is responsible for this is, is, just, is just for the birds. It, it, it doesn't hold a, any, any water uh, uh, at all. And I think it is a bit of a cheek, uh, actually, putting all three, um, uh, all, all three motions uh, to, to, together. Um, particularly given the, the legal um, bar that there is on extending the, the, the transition and, um, uh, and, and why on earth we should halt Brexit, I have no idea. I agree with my honourable friend that it is time to move on uh, and that is exactly what I want to do. I do not want to sit in this place for another three or four years debating Brexit. I've had enough of that. I had enough of that in the last Parliament, and I do not want to go through it again. Uh, I, we made that decision, uh, the country made that decision, made that decision spectacularly, and, uh, uh, and I'm not going to do that. But there is one issue that I, that I would raise, um, which, which is the difficulty that we have of conducting these negotiations in open session. Every negotiation is conducted in open session with people briefing journalists on either side as we go through. And the reason for that is a fundamental problem with the, with the dispute resolution mechanism that was set up um, when, the, when the, withhold, with, with the, the withholding agreement, uh, the, sorry, the, the withdrawal agreement was, was, was agreed in the first place. All the effort in that, in that agreement was down to arbitration which is not a, 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 an enclosed uh, area. Uh, it should not have been straight into arbitration. They should have had, first of all, a process of mediation, which is um, a, a, a incredibly uh, discreet. Uh, and and you, it, if you've been through a commercial uh, mediation, you will, you will know uh, that uh, you do not blab uh, to journalists or to anyone else what happens during, during, that, um, during that mediation. So I think if I were doing this again, um, not that I did it, but you know, if, I, if, we were do, if we were going through this again, I would strongly recommend that uh, the, the, the government went for mediation. Of course, it is not in the interest of the EU to go for mediation. Uh, they do not understand the, the, the concept uh, very, very well. So that's really all I wanted to say uh, on this, except for, except for, for one thing. I think, I think the Honourable Gentleman mentioned the, the uh, amount that um, the, the Leave campaign was fined. The first organisation to be fined for not, not keeping proper accounts, not declaring the right amount in, in, in this debate, was the Liberal Democrats, who were fined £18,000 by the Electoral Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir David. And the reason I wanted to take part in this debate is not because I'm trying to stop democracy in its tracks, and even as a brand new member of parliament, I haven't had the two, three years of debating Brexit. It's not because I'm desperate to have my fair share. It's because Twickenham, my constituency, appeared in the top 10 constituencies for all three of these petitions. Um, and I know from the referendum result where 67% of my residents voted to remain and indeed uh, the humbling and overwhelming uh, result uh, in my favour in the general election which was obviously largely fought on Brexit when the good people of Twickenham, Teddington, Witten, St Margaret's and uh, the Hamptons 
put their faith in me. The majority of my residents are pro-European and they want me to give them a voice and that's what I'm here to do today. And it's fair to say many are heartbroken, like me, that we have left the European Union and they genuinely felt both for economic reasons as well as social and emotional reasons that the UK should remain in the European Union. Many of my constituents are outward looking and internationalist in perspective like me and like me many have enjoyed the freedoms of being able to live and work in the European Union, fall in love without borders and simply wished the same opportunities for their children. So whilst of course I accept with a heavy heart that we have now left the European Union and the electorate spoke very clearly in December, I don't deny that, I still fundamentally believe there's no deal that could be negotiated that could be uh, as beneficial as continued membership of the European Union. And I am deeply worried about the damage that Brexit will cause to this country's economy um, and to our standing in the world, which will be long-lasting. Uh, and the point about uh, the, the, the petitions uh, referring to COVID, and in particular I want to speak to the third petition about extending transition, which I and my party have very vociferously called for, not because... We no longer, we, not because we don't accept the result and we want to delay ad infinitum, but businesses and business organisations, we're not talking about the Council of Europe here, we are talking about people who are struggling to keep their businesses afloat in the middle of a pandemic, where jobs are being lost hand over fist. Businesses and business organisations have said time and again to potentially end up in a no-deal situation at the end of a transition period is impossible for businesses in terms of putting all the infrastructure they need to put in place in terms of their supply chains. Yes, of course. Would the Honourable Lady not agree that actually, uh, and certainly from my businesses in my constituency, what they say to me, it's the uncertainty from the delay after delay which is what's causing most damage to our, our economy and to businesses. Wouldn't she not agree that actually it's that delay and further delay uh, by extending the transition period would only prolong that? Well, there are two types of uncertainty. I mean, crashing out without a deal at the end of transition is... Un complete uncertainty in terms of the unknown and whilst there may be some uncertainty in extending the transition period at least they're able to continue to trade easily and um, one of the points I want to touch on uh, later in my, uh, in my speech is, is on medicines in particular where, where, the, where the industry has spoken out very clearly in the last week or so so I do think that the government choosing uh, to pass the deadline for extending uh, an extension to the transition period uh, as we you know, hurtle towards a potential no deal uh, was, was reckless and, and a monumental um, act of self-harm to this country. I wanted to very briefly touch on, on three, three points. The rights of EU citizens um, and naturalisation uh, was the first of those. I am concerned... Uh, given that we've already seen some rolling back from commitments in the, in the withdrawal agreement about the rights of UK citizens in the EU and UK citizens in the UK being at risk. And in particular, uh, in my borough of Richmond-upon-Thames, we've got 14,500 EU nationals who are applying for pre-settled or settled status under the EU citizenship scheme. And back in May, the Home Office snuck out some guidance which made it harder for those with settled status to secure British citizenship. This has thrown up a number of individuals' future into the air. And unfortunately, despite my letter to the Home Secretary on the 29th of May on this topic, I've yet to receive a response. Uh, 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 thank you for giving way. But, but aren't we here talking about the human cost of Brexit? And yes, we're talking about uncertainties. But um, isn't, isn't it very important that we also look not just at business uncertainties, but human people's uncertainties in this situation and the cruel situation that some of them find themselves in? Absolutely, and, and the business situation is also a human situation because we're talking about jobs being lost and livelihoods being lost. Um, I very briefly just wanted to touch on agriculture and food standards, mainly because my inbox has been overflowing with emails about this issue and many concerns from constituents about potential agricultural and food standards being undermined as we enter into trade deals because the Liberal Democrats and others have consistently, as the agricultural bill has gone through Parliament, tried to amend it to protect our standards, but the government has refused to acquiesce on this point. And indeed, in terms of the trade bill, they are refusing any uh, democratic and parliamentary scrutiny. I'm not entirely sure how that has taken back control. 
And the final area I wanted to touch on, and on this, Sir David, I must declare an interest prior to coming to this place. I worked nine years in the pharmaceutical industry, and I, I still have a small shareholding in Novartis Pharmaceuticals. On medicines it is, and, and health in general, it is clear there is no oven-ready deal that was promised back in December. And obviously, in the midst of a pandemic, people are rightly concerned about their health. And a number of constituents have written to me about their concerns about the UK leaving the European uh, Medicines Agency uh, at the end of this year, and what that might mean in terms of the licensing of a COVID vaccine or treatment. Uh, they're also concerned about us leaving the, the, the EHIC scheme, which means that we can uh, get treatment abroad and, and European citizens can get uh, treatment here. The point about medicines and uh, vaccines regulation applies equally for non-COVID treatments. And, and I, I appreciate before somebody else intervenes on me that the Secretary of State has made an announcement today for the UK to collaborate with uh, the US and Canada and other regulatory agencies on cancer medicines, which is extremely welcome. And I, and I actually congratulate the government for that because we must remember the UK is only 3% of the global pharmaceutical market. So if we go our own way on medicines, British citizens will be further back in the queue to get new medicines and treatments. Let us not forget that. But the deal today that was announced by the Secretary of State is only for cancer treatments. And there are many other disease areas where British citizens risk being left behind and missing out on innovative treatments. But more pressing, however, and this is a concern raised by FPA and the ABPI, the European and the British uh, medicines, uh, the, the pharmaceutical uh, trade associations last week, with a supply chain that's already been hit by the uh, challenges of COVID um, through this pandemic, they are very, very concerned that if we end up with a no deal at the end of December, that we could end up with real supply chain issues with medicines crossing uh, over the channel. And they have called for urgently a mutual recognition agreement to ensure that important tests and inspections are recognized either side of the channel. There's also still a lack of clarity as to how the Northern Ireland protocol will work in terms of regulated products such as medicines, um, should there be uh, a, a no trade deal put in place with uh, medicines being shipped from Great Britain to Northern Ireland and how they will be treated on the other side of the border. So whilst the deadline for securing an extension to the transition uh, is, has passed, although I would say where there is a will, there is a way. So if there's a last minute change of heart, I'm sure the European Union will be all ears. It is imperative in the short time remaining that we secure the closest possible alignment with the European Union in terms of uh, customs, in terms of regula uh, regulations on medicines and other regulated products, and in terms of our food and agricultural standards. And let's not forget people and our EU citizens and how we treat them and how our citizens are treated in the EU. Thank you. Thank you, Sir David, for the opportunity to speak in this debate on three very important petitions. Each of those, as you mentioned at the beginning, have been signed by over 100,000 people and show the depth of feeling surrounding these issues. It is also, I believe, a great demonstration of democracy in action that people in the street, the public, can have their views heard in this celebrious building. With your permission, Sir David, I will briefly address all three petitions. The first, halt Brexit for a public inquiry. The UK's departure from the European Union looms, but questions remain about the legitimacy of the referendum. The Electoral Commission said illegal overspending occurred during the referendum. Were the vote and or any subsequent political acts affected? Article 50 was triggered. Was the overspend known at that time? These questions remain unanswered. A significant focus for this position, petition are the questions of overspending, its effects and the timing of the release of information relative to the triggering of Article 50. There is little doubt, as the Electoral Commission insisted, that more than one group broke electoral law on spending limits, in some cases by quite substantial amounts. It is less clear what the effects have been. A poll by Opinium in 2017 suggested that 26% of Brexit voters felt they had been misled by promises made during the campaign and that voters in that sample would have by then have voted 47% to 
to 44 to remain. With regards to subsequent political acts, this seems a more serious concern. Evidence gathered and analysed by the Institute for Government in March 2019, but also supported by many other commentators since, point to dramatic consequences. This is not the place for the detail, but an introductory paragraph from the report referring to the effects on ministers, civil servants, public bodies, money devolution and parliament states. In each area, we find that the challenge of negotiating, legislating and implementing Brexit has called into question how government works in the United Kingdom. The roles of the Prime Minister and his Cabinet, civil servants and their departments are of parliamentarians and the devolved administrations have all seen their roles considerably affected and changed significantly during this period. As for the timing of Article 50, it was invoked on the 29th of March 2017. One month earlier, on the 24th of February, the Telegraph reported that the Electoral Commission was investigating the spending of vote to leave and Britain stronger in Europe. So clearly, rumours of an overspend were known to the Cabinet, well known before Article 50 was revoked. Therefore, it is my belief that there is sufficient doubt about the legitimacy of the referendum result surrounding spending limits and the political processes undertaken during that time to warrant a formal investigation that Brexit be halted. Yes, I will. Gentlemen giving way. Is he aware that the points that he is putting on behalf of the petitioners were actually put to the courts in this country uh, on judicial review? And the court said, threw that case out and said it lacked all merit. I'm aware of that. Uh, thank you, Zoran Gent, for his intervention. I'm aware of that and I await the outcome with uh, some excitement. I therefore fully support that petition to hold Brexit for public inquiry into these matters. Moving on to the second petition, Sir David, to establish a public inquiry into the conduct of the 2016 EU referendum. There is now strong evidence of serious misconduct during the 2016 EU referendum, including interference by foreign actors and governments. I use the term actors sparingly. This must be investigated under the Inquiries Act of 2005. There are certain, certain reports of interference. The Intelligence and Security Committee of this Parliament report on interference concluded that the UK government have actively avoided looking for evidence that Russia interfered and that the government's response wasn't fit for purpose. It was unacceptable that the government delayed the publication of this report, this very, very important report, by a year. Kieran Martin, head of the UK's National Cyber Security Centre, confirmed that Russian hackers attacked British media, telecoms and energy companies over the last year. That the UK government has allegedly avoided looking for evidence is certainly a cause for suspicion, but that in itself is not so good evidence of interference. Similarly, being able only to refer to the suspects as Russian hackers in a press release does not allow us to form a strong or firm conclusion that foreign actors or governments were involved. Where there are strong suspicions in any area, in any area of national security, in the context of the protection of a democracy, further investigation must take place in the public interest. I believe that this case had been made based on those strong suspicions and there is sufficient evidence to warrant an investigation into these circumstances, and that would be best taken forward by a public inquiry. I would therefore add my support to this petition to establish a public inquiry into the conduct of a 2016 referendum. Finally, Sir David, the third petition to extend the transition, delay negotiations until after the coronavirus outbreak has been dealt with. The government must consider delaying negotiations so, that, so they can concentrate on dealing with the coronavirus pandemic and the resultant health, economic and social upheaval and unprecedented circumstances we currently face, which can only be dealt by a government with a clear, single focus on the problems of a massive, on a massive scale caused by the coronavirus pandemic. To do so would necessitate extending the transition period as there can only be a one-off extension which should be for two years. This is, of course, an obvious case we made for the extension of the transition period. 
Notwithstanding COVID, the UK is clearly not ready for a hard Brexit. Up to 7,000 trucks carrying goods from the, EU to, from the UK to the EU might face two-day delays after the Brexit transition, according to a letter from Cabinet Minister Michael Gove. Lloyds and Bartleys were amongst the first UK banks giving notice to EK citizens, United Kingdom citizens living in the EU to warn their accounts will be closed on the 31st of December unless there is an agreement. Border control posts at Northern Ireland's ports will almost certainly not be ready in time due to Stormont Minister Edwin Poots. Make UK estimates that UK firms will have to complete 275 million customer forms, up from 55 million, and HMRC has estimated the cost of this to be £15 million a year. I strongly believe that if you ask the public today if they think we should delay Brexit, even for those reasons alone, a majority would agree. Some Brexiters, as we have heard today, would not, of course, agree. Getting Brexit done for some is more important than dealing exclusively with the current pandemic which engulfs this country and threatens us all with dire and unimaginable consequences. Public opinion, especially that influenced by our right-wing media, is not necessarily the best basis for policy development. By the government's own admission, any deal will only be a bare-bones trade agreement. Their own analysis says that this would be up to 9% GDP hit over the next 15 years, heaping further disadvantage onto our economy as we seek to recover from COVID. All of these factors require the undivided attention of government without the distraction of contentious negotiations on the arrangement to be put in place following the end of the current transition period. I would therefore add my support to this petition to extend the transition and delay the negotiations until the coronavirus outbreak is brought properly under control. Thank you, Sir David. Indeed, Sir David, it is, of course, a pleasure to uh, wind up for the opposition with you in the chair, and I'd like to thank my honourable friend, the member for Hartlepool, for the way in which he opened up our discussion this afternoon, um, and other members for their contribution to the debate. Now, the concerns raised in these petitions uh, probably reflect the time at which they were launched, which was several months ago. Um, and uh, the priority now is to look at the challenges we face with just weeks to go before the deal we need on our future relationship with the European Union has to be concluded. Now, on the issues raised in petition uh, 300412, Labour pressed the government, um, perhaps with some uh, prescience, to give itself some flexibility when Parliament, uh, when Parliament debated the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. Uh, and we tabled an amendment to that effect just in case there were unforeseen events uh, that might lead the government needing some wriggle room. I have to say we didn't anticipate a global pandemic at that time, but nevertheless, we made that case. Our amendment was rejected and the departure date was locked in law. The government could have changed it before the 1st of July, but they didn't, nor did the European Union propose a delay. We left the EU on the 31st of January, uh, and we will leave the transition on the 31st of December. We accept that completely. So I have to say that I share some of the exasperation of the uh, Honourable Member for Henley, if not for the same reason, but on some of the contributions from members opposite um, and the allegations they're making about the position of the opposition. And they should, and we should all have um, some humility and some honesty in looking back at the paralysis in Parliament over the last four years, and recognise that many of the delays were caused by the way in which the Conservative Party was tearing itself apart on the issue, and that some of those who delayed a deal being reached were those described, I think, by the former Conservative Chancellor um, as the Brexit extremists within his own party, and indeed uh, the Prime Minister, utilising the issue as he egged them on on his rise to power. But we are now into the final month of negotiations and both the UK, and the UK government and the EU 
are clearly seeking resolution within weeks to secure the deal we need by the 31st of December. Now, the other two petitions do raise real concerns, and they were clearly exacerbated by the government's handling of the report from Parliament's Conservative-chaired Intelligence and Security Committee, the publication of which was deliberately and unnecessarily delayed by the Prime Minister until after the general election, uh, and which was damning in its conclusion that the government, quote, had not seen or sought evidence of successful interference in UK democratic processes. As one of its members said when it, the report was published in July, the report reveals that, no, quote, the report reveals that no one in government knew if Russia interfered in or sought to influence the referendum because they did not want to know. Now, there are real issues here that deserve consideration, but they cannot halt Brexit as the petitioners seek because we have, as a number of members have acknowledged, already left the European Union. That's the result of the mandate the government received in last December's election, as the uh, Honourable Member for Stoke on Trent South mentioned. But it is only one half of the mandate. The other half is to deliver the deal that the Prime Minister promised the British people. That pledged an, I quote, ambitious, wide-ranging and balanced economic partnership with, quote, no tariffs, fees, charges or quantitative restrictions across all sectors. It, it pledged a deal that would safeguard, quotes, workers' rights, consumer and environmental protection and keep people safe with a, quote, broad, comprehensive and balanced security partnership. Not proposals, not a wish list, but an agreement, one that was ready to sign off. In the Prime Minister's words, quotes, we've got a deal that's oven ready. We've just got to put it in at Gas Mark 4. Give it 20 minutes and Bob's your uncle. Now, originally, he said, it would be done by July. Despite the pandemic, then, forgetting his words, it would be done by September. That came and went too. So he set a new ultimatum of mid-October, which he then dropped over the weekend after his conversation with the European Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen. Now, as a number of members have said, businesses need clarity. The government's providing confusion. The same incompetence that we've seen in the handling of the pandemic is now threatening jobs and the security of our country through its handling of these negotiations. I will indeed. I'm, I'm grateful for my honourable friend in, in previous debates over this long uh, di discussion. We've disagreed. I essentially agree with the approach he's, he's made. But is he not being a little asymmetric? It's his job to attack the government and uh, criticise and analyse what, what they're doing. But does he not feel that one of the reasons that there isn't an agreement now is that the EU have withdrawn uh, what they offered right at the beginning of this, a Canada-style agreement, and they've also withdrawn uh, the recognition of this country as, as a third country, which previously was on offer? Uh, well, I'm grateful for my uncle Prince, uh, uh, question, and uh, he's right, we haven't always agreed on these issues over the uh, last four years. Um, but we are, I think, in roughly... Uh, the same place now in wanting to secure a deal uh, by December. Not just any deal, but the deal that the government have pledged. Um, and it's not, as I say, um, a, a, a deal that was um, described by the Prime Minister as something that might be achieved. It was something that he said was there, ready to go, just got to press the button. Um, and I will come... I will return in a moment to the specific question of uh, Canada because I think it's an important one. Vera Hall. Uh, isn't it also true, it's a bit unfair to blame that this Brexit wasn't done in the last three years and all the people who wanted to delay it, when actually um, it was the Tories and the Conservative government that didn't get the Brexit deal done over the last two, uh, three years. And they dithered and, and, and argued among themselves and, and even decapitated their own Prime Minister. Isn't it true that actually it was also the Conservative Party who was, who was to blame that Brexit didn't get done for such a long time? Well, I thank the uh, Honourable Member for that intervention, and indeed that's the uh, 
point I was making a moment ago, that it was that uh, uh, agony within the Conservative Party as it tore itself apart um, that uh, was a significant delaying factor in getting the deal done. But, as I say, a number of members have said that we, businesses require certainty. So I'd like to ask the Minister, um, who we welcome back to her uh, place uh, at uh, Cabinet Office Questions last Thursday, and I'm delighted to see uh, in the front bench today. I'd like to ask her four specific questions, um, for which I'd be grateful for replying her closing remarks. Can she guarantee to the automotive sector that they will face no tariffs from the 1st of January, in accordance with the Prime Minister's promise, despite the apparent decision of the government not to press to secure an agreement on rules of origin? Secondly, can she assure the financial and legal sectors, which are hugely important to our economy, that the government's deal will allow them to do business without new barriers, as the Prime Minister promised? Thirdly, can she guarantee that there will be no weakening of the arrangements that we have had within the European Union to keep the UK safe from serious international crime and terrorism, and in particular, that we will retain access to systems such as the European Criminal Records Information System, which shares data about prior convictions across all EU countries. And finally, and it returns to uh, the point my honourable friend made, uh, given that the government have insisted that they want a Canada-style deal, and it kind of raises the question about why that is off the table, um, would she confirm that the government would be willing to accept the non-regression clause provisions within the EU-Canada deal on workers' rights and environmental protections? Because those are precisely the points that were ripped out of the withdrawal agreement after the December election. And if the government were prepared um, to uh, accept those, it would clearly be a game changer in the negotiations. Now, these are fairly straightforward questions because they're all based on promises made by the Prime Minister. So it should be relatively simple for her to say yes to each one of them because if not, I hate to think it, but the government might not have been telling the truth. The... Coronavirus pandemic, which is referenced in uh, Petition 300412, makes it even more important that the government delivers the deal that the Prime Minister promised to support jobs, the security of our country, business and people's livelihoods. And as we look to the future, rebuilding from the devastating impact of the virus, we can't face the additional problems of a disruptive departure from the transition. Now, COVID-19 has clearly taken people's bandwidth in the civil service, in politics, in the EU too. Businesses have not been able to prepare in the way that they would otherwise, as their capacity has been stretched. I have to say it was unfortunate that the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster tried to point the fling finger of blame on businesses uh, for not being prepared in his recent uh, statement to the House. They're not helped by the unanswered questions that, the, uh, that remain. Businesses around the country have reasonable questions, not just about trading goods, but about trade in services. The agricultural sector have questions about health, food safety, SPS standards and checks. The Honourable Member for Twickenham has talked about the problems of the pharmaceutical sector. I've talked to many other sectors in my, uh, uh, in my role who simply can't, as businesses representing critical sectors of the economy, can't get a hearing from this government. Now, the government have maintained throughout the coronavirus crisis that they could deliver a deal in the time frame they've allotted for themselves. They'll be judged by that promise. As it stands at the moment, they need to get a grip and deliver the deal, not any deal, but the deal that they promised last December, the deal that we need for the country to move on. Minister. You, Sir David. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. This is my first Westminster Hall debate since returning from maternity leave, so I feel a little bit more like I should have been contributing to the last debate about what it's like to raise a baby during a pandemic. I'm a little more qualified in many ways. I also have a very strange feeling of deja vu, as though nothing has changed in the past year that I've been away. But of course, in that time, we that many things have changed. We've had a general election, and we've also left the EU. 
and I think in many ways the language that we've discussed here today, talking about Brexit as if it hasn't happened, is a little out of date. I'd like to thank the, the Honourable Member for Hartlepool for bringing forward this debate today on behalf of the Petitions Committee and for speaking on the three petitions before us. Honourable Members have put their arguments across with a great deal of vigour but not rancour and that's a really refreshing change from the last Parliament. In responding to calls in these petitions to establish a public inquiry into the conduct of the 2016 EU referendum or halt Brexit for a public inquiry, or to extend the transition period and delay negotiations, I would like to state that there are no plans to do any of these things. Two of the petitions focus on alleged, bre alleged breaches of electoral law in the 2016 referendum, but these allegations have been rightly investigated and dealt with by the Electoral Commission, the independent regulator. The case is now closed. Our focus should not be on returning to the divisions of the recent past, but instead on this country's bright future. I would like to use this speech to consider a number of points in further detail. Firstly, the evident legitimacy of the EU referendum, our stance on foreign interference, the important role of the Electoral Commission, and our future focus and the ongoing negotiations with the EU. First, let's turn to the evident legitimacy of the EU referendum. Others have highlighted this today, but I shall repeat it again. 17.4 million people voted to leave the EU. More people voted for Brexit than have ever voted for anything else in the UK. And it's a pleasure to welcome my honourable friend for Don Valley, who is in many ways a product of that will of the people. People from across England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland voted to leave the European Union. This clear mandate from the people of our union has since been rightfully respected and delivered. Ignoring the referendum result would have been deeply damaging to British democracy and we saw the damage that the last three years of indecision caused in Parliament. Additionally, the legality of the EU referendum is beyond doubt. It was carried out based on legislation passed by Parliament with clear and repeated commitments from the government to implement the outcome. The EU Referendum Act 2015 was scrutinised and debated in Parliament for over 34 hours. The provisions relating to the conduct of the referendum were carefully scrutinised and ratified by Parliament. More recently, in the 2019 general election, the British people cast their votes once again and elected, with a substantial majority, a government committed to upholding the result of the referendum. Following the election, Parliament voted with clear majorities in both houses for the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020. On accusations of foreign interference, I'd like to emphasise that it is, and always will be, an absolute priority to protect the UK against foreign interference and maintain the security and integrity of our de democratic processes. It's absolutely unacceptable for any nation, including Russia, to interfere in the democratic, democratic processes of another country, and we take any allegations of interference in UK democratic processes by a foreign government very, very seriously. We've seen no evidence of successful interference in the EU referendum. However, we will continue to safeguard against future risks, strengthen our resilience and ensure that the regulatory framework is as effective as possible. The government's committed to making sure the rules work now and in the future. In July 2019, we established the Defending Democracy Programme, bringing together expertise and capabilities from across government departments, the security intelligence agencies and civil service to ensure UK democracy remains open, vibrant and secure. As announced in the Queen's speech, we are bringing forward new legislation to provide the security services and law enforcement agencies with the tools they need to disrupt hostile state activity. Now let us turn to the important role of the Electoral Commission. The Electoral Commission is the independent regulatory body responsible for ensuring that referenda are run effectively and in accordance with the law. The Electoral Commission has the right to conduct investigations into alleged offences and take action when offences have been committed. Such investigations are rightly independent of the government. The Electoral Commission did indeed undertake investigations into the EU referendum and regrettably levied fines on multiple groups on both sides of the referendum campaign. In addition to the fines levied against Leave campaigners, Remain supporting groups such as Unison or the GMB also breached political finance rules and were fined by the Electoral Commission for failing to deliver an accurate spending return. More serious matters were, were referred to the police, which investigated them further and again found no evidence of criminal activity. We've now entered, uh, turning to the uh, future focus, that we've now entered the final phase of negotiations with the EU. 
Last week, the ninth round of negotiations took place. There were positive discussions in the core areas of a trade and economic agreement, notably trade in goods and services, transport, energy, social security and participation in EU programmes. However, significant differences remain, notably on the level playing field and on fisheries. The Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster provided a written ministerial statement earlier today with an update on this round of negotiations. The Prime Minister spoke to President von der Leyen on 3rd of October to review the progress of negotiations. They agreed on the importance of finding an agreement, if at all possible, and instructed the chief negotiators to work intensively to try to do so, given how short now, time now is before the European Council on the 15th of October, when we hope we can find an agreement. And I'm afraid, whilst I would like to answer some specifics on negotiations, it's a little above my pay grade, um, so I'm afraid I can't do that on this occasion. <coughs> Since the last round of negotiations are set out in terms of reference, UK negotiators have continued informal discussions with the Commission in both Brussels and London. We've been clear from the outset about the principles underlying our approach. We're seeking a relationship that respects our sovereignty and which has a free trade agreement at its core, similar to those the EU has already agreed with like-minded countries like Canada. As the Prime Minister has set out, there needs to be an agreement with the EU by the time of the European Council meeting on 15th of October in order for it to be enforced before the end of the transition period on the 31st of December. By then, if there is no agreement, then there will not be a free trade agreement. This would mean we'd, be trading in a, uh, we'd have a trading arrangement with the EU more akin to Australia's. That would still be a good outcome for the UK. It would represent us reclaiming our independence as a sovereign nation, and that is what the British peop people voted for twice. That said, we remain committed to working hard to reach an agreement by the middle of this month. The government was elected on a manifesto which made clear the transition period would end on the 31st of December 2020. This is now enshrined in UK law. At the second meeting of the Withdrawal Agreement Joint Committee on the 12th of June, the UK formally notified the EU that it will neither accept nor seek any extension to the transition period. Our position remains unchanged. Under no circumstances will the government ask for or agree to an extension of the transition period. The Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and Lord True have kept both houses informed of progress throughout the negotiations. And I would just like to turn to some of the, question, some of the issues raised by colleagues today in this vigorous and lively debate. I welcome the uh, work the Honourable Lady for the Twickenham is doing to give her constituents a voice, and it's right that we bring everyone together in this next stage of our journey, a country's journey. The Trade Secretary has repeatedly given assurances on food standards, and just to say that the Trade Bill is actually about the role of our existing FDAs, not about future uh, free trade agreements. I appreciate the contribution from the Honourable Member for Ayr, Carrick and Cumnock. I've always found it very peculiar that his party has such distaste for the results of referenda at the same time as calling for more of them and that they can so unreservedly champion petitions as a democratic device over a good old-fashioned election result, but I appreciate his contribution. I also want to thank uh, the gracious way in which the Honourable Member for Hartlepool acknowledged that the majority of his constituents don't want to overturn the referendum result. He asked how the pandemic has affected readiness of businesses, and that's clearly been a challenge, and it was also raised by the Honourable Member for Sheffield Central. Unfortunately, the pandemic has meant that businesses are rightly thinking of, of many other things, and we're very keen to get the message out that things will be changing for those who deal with the EU, whether or not we get an FTA. And that message needs to be rammed home, because I think there's a misunderstanding in this place sometimes that everything will be the same if we get a deal, and that's simply not the case, which is why we have done a lot of work on transition readiness, and we have a, a transition checker on gov.uk now that people can go to, uh, information on how to get ready for January, and I very much encourage people to look at it and this week we're also um, publishing an updated border operating model my honourable friend for Stoke on Trent South rightly reminds us we've left the EU the public have made their views known about further delay and we will not be extending the transition the Honourable Member for Black, Blackley and Broughton draws an interesting comparison with the United States. The government shares many of his ambitions on how any future relationship should protect our sovereignty I welcome again the member uh, that my honourable friend for Don Valley that in his first Westminster Hall debate and on a subject on which he feels so passionately. We need to move on, he says, and I agree. There's a difference between a petition and an election, as I mentioned earlier. And in December, the public made their views clear. 
The Honourable Lady for Bath, I note, is more popular, vastly more popular in her constituency than her party is with the, the rest of the country. And I think that's because she, she makes her case so gracefully. And I share her regret over the division that we have seen in recent years. I hope we can move on united over the love that we have for our country. My Honourable Friend for Henley shares his exasperation that we have to repeat what is now a very old debate, but I welcome his valuable work with the Council of Europe. And with that, I'd just like to thank again the Honourable Member of Hartley Paul for bringing forward this debate today. We've heard a number of arguments on this topic, but I remain entirely unconvinced that we need to launch a public inquiry on the EU referendum, halt Brexit to launch uh, a, a inquiry uh, or extend the transition period and delay negotiations. Indeed, the government has absolutely no plan to do any of these things. There is clear legitimacy underpinning the EU referendum from both the 17.4 million across our union that voted to leave and the legal scrutiny that was applied to the EU Referendum Act. Additionally, as we've made clear on a number of occasions, we have not seen evidence of successful interference in the referendum and allegations of electoral overspend have rightly been investigated and dealt with by the Electoral Commission. We now need to focus on our bright future, negotiating our future partnership with the EU and forging trade deals with the rest of the world. Mike Hill to wind up the debate. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Sir David. Um, I, I obviously clearly, on behalf of the Petitions Committee, thank the petitioners for um, achieving over 100,000 signatures on each of these petitions and therefore ensuring that um, such petitions within the rules of the House get debated. Um, I, note, uh, I thank also uh, the front benches and, and sp uh, especially the Minister uh, for clarifying the position in regard to my own constituency. It was the largest leave constituency in the North East. Uh, and as such, uh, as an indiv individual MP, I represented their interest all the way through, um, which takes me to the Honourable Member for Stoke-on-Trent, whose predecessor also was in the same position as me. But what we have to remember in these debates, Sir David, is the fact that these are not past political, these are petitions debates. And as a member of the Petitions Committee, I am impartial irrespective of my own views and opinions, and I hope that I've got that across, because time and again, uh, they are seen to be political, and that does travel into the newspapers, and that is not in the interests of Parliament or the petition system in its own right. Thank uh, members from Bath, Blackburn, Broughton, Don Valley, Henley, and Twickenham, uh, and for, for their, uh, their interesting contributions to this debate. Um, I, 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 it's good to be back in, in, in Westminster Hall, back in our place, uh, Sir David. Uh, and, I, and I hope that the petitioners um, forgive us for mixing them all together, but COVID itself has impacted on the petitions committee's operations, hence the need to prioritise this. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 306691 relating to the impact of... That's entirely the wrong one that I picked up there, I'm afraid. Uh, the... The question is that this House has considered e-petitions 241848, 250178 and 300412 relating to the UK's departure from the EU. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order. Just before colleagues leave, um, it is very good to be back in Westminster Hall. There are teething problems, particularly with the way I chaired proceedings. But uh, if you could please leave through that door there, which says exit only. And uh, the Chairman of Ways and Means did say that to save all the doorkeepers coming in, if you have touched the microphones, could you just wipe them with the wipes there, which are next to uh, Graham, please? It, it would help. And if you have any other observations, about the way you feel that this session did or didn't work, please let the Chairman of Ways and Means know. Thank you. Grand Committee Room, I didn't. The proceeding has ended.